Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Our call to <laughs> worship this morning is from the book of Isaiah, the ninth chapter, verses 6 and 7. And it begins on page 618. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. <coughs> I'd like to say a little bit of a different prayer this morning. I had the privilege of attending the Army-Navy football game yesterday. And I can tell you from the, the look I saw in the faces of these young men and women, it made me feel that there is hope for our country and our world. These young men and women who are dedicating their lives and willing to sacrifice their lives for us. Now they're in school now, but when they get out of school, they're gonna be on active duty. So Heavenly Father, I pray for these young men and women that I saw yesterday Please protect them and guide them. And I pray for all the members of our military that are willing to lay down their lives for us and to protect us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bill. Love our country, love our military. Uh, it's necessary. Amen. Um, good morning, church. God bless you for being here. Um, a mild, right, Gail? A mild December day, but still a beautiful day that he's made. And we're thankful for that. Please turn off your cell phones if you haven't done so already or put them on manner mode. Um, special welcome to Brett Knappick. <laughs> Hi, Brett. <laughs> Brett's Brett's uh, home for a couple of weeks before he goes off on the ship again, so it'll be good to have him home for Christmas anyway. Um, all right, no one else visiting with us today? All right, Carol, welcome back, Carol. Yeah, we missed you. So, holding down that part of the congregation there. Um, all right, so very, very quickly, this coming Wednesday, we don't have regular prayer and Bible study. We have our uh, annual Christmas party. It is absolutely <laughs> a wonderful time. And we hope that uh, you will um, at least uh, plan to be with us and uh, join in it. Uh, would love to see you there. The Yankee Swap is optional. Uh, if you're able to bring a side dish, fantastic. If you're not able to bring anything, fantastic. Just bring yourself. We'll have more than enough food. And uh, if you do want to participate in the food, uh, please see uh, Jeanette Holmes or uh, Liz Gillette, and we thank you ladies for uh, undertaking that. Also, choir practice is coming um, Saturday morning, 9.30 at the church. Uh, regular prayer and Bible study, I should say, will resume on January 3rd. Uh, we talked about having it on Wednesday, December 20th, but we're not. We usually kind of take a couple of uh, um, Wednesdays off during that time. Uh, because it's a busy time, so the regular, this will be the last Wednesday gathering until January 3rd. Uh, also, we have discipleship uh, class today uh, after the service in Fellowship Hall, and um, we uh, look forward to that time. And then also, uh, please participate, uh, consider participating in the shoebox ministry uh, that we typically undertake online. Please see Jane Campbell or my wife, uh, will be able to help you uh, train, make that transaction if you, you don't have a computer or are unfamiliar with that stuff. Uh, and then finally, I'd like to call a special business meeting for next Sunday, right after the morning service. For uh, it's, it's basically for um, making a decision regarding two things. One is to take the current funds from the bank loan, which are about close to 67 um, $180. Um, use that to deal with uh, descaling the main line and we'll get the additional monies from another fund in the business meeting. And then, so that would be the first move. Uh, and then to appropriate, 
$8,125 to have the descaling of the main line done. And the reason for that is because last Sunday uh, we um, spent $2,000 to get the main line uh, unclogged. And uh, so it's been 43 years, there's a lot of iron and buildup, and uh, so uh, it's important to make sure that that is addressed. We don't want to spend another $2,000, okay? to just unclog something. We want to try to get a more uh, long-term fix for that. Um, okay, and I think that's all I have to share. Uh, nothing, Jerry? Fantastic. <laughs> Anybody else? Any, anything else for the concrete? Okay, fantastic. Uh, we're going to sing our next song, Bob. Our tithes and offering verse this morning is from the book of Proverbs. There is gold and an abundance of jewels, but the lips of knowledge are a more precious thing. Heavenly Father, bless our gifts into this ministry, into the good ground of this ministry. In Jesus' name we pray.
uh, that we get those ministry updates and those insight takes. And I totally agree with you because uh, it just starts out little, but then hopefully it becomes an avalanche, you know, and just really does amazing things. So uh, any, anything on your heart and mind before we have a time of prayer? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we come this morning to seek your face. Um, We thank you so very, very much for opening the eyes of our hearts years ago to believe Uh, We can't bless you enough and thank you enough for being able, uh, for for doing that, uh, that we might be able to be here this morning. Uh, We believe in all of our hearts uh, with your holy word, and we believe in all of our hearts with the Lord Jesus Christ, and we, we know According to our faith and the testimony of scripture, we know that he came from heaven uh, and became like us in every way, uh, yet without sin. That he might be the holy and perfect and acceptable and ultimate sacrifice, whereby we might be able to be forgiven and have the gift of eternal life. Uh, These... uh, are amazing things, they're wonderful things, and Lord, we just can't uh, thank you enough. Uh, I wanna lift up each person here this morning. Uh, we're, we're so different in many ways, and yet uh, you have made us all one in Christ, and you have uh, made us all one when it comes to salvation. Uh, yet you've given us different gifts and different personalities and different interests and focus. And, and as the Lord Jesus uh, uh, comes out of our heart and spirit, uh, we just see the amazing uh, person of Christ in so many, many different ways uh, as we behold him in this congregation, as we behold each other Uh, one another um, face to face. We uh, just see the Lord Jesus Christ in a marvelous way. And Father, thank you for um, persevering with us and thank you for shepherding us the way in which you do and thank you for striving with us and having uh, so great, great patience. Um, As I said in Sunday school, thank you that you don't take a cookie cutter approach to each and every one of us. Uh, you're, we're so different and you work with us in so many, many different ways and we're thankful for that. And Lord, I don't know exactly how to pray this morning for my brothers and sisters in Christ, but you know the longings and the desires of their hearts. Uh, you know uh, the, the darkest, and, uh, darkest and the most recessed areas of the heart Uh, Lord, the areas that we don't always let you into, um, you know them perfectly and completely, and yet just as I am, uh, you you welcome each and every one of us, uh, and you encourage us to come boldly before your throne of grace, and we do that this morning, and we thank you also that you've shed the Holy Spirit abroad in our hearts uh, when we don't know how to pray. Uh, you lift up uh, prayers through him, uh, through groaning, groanings and utterances that, that we have uh, no understanding or imagination or um, uh, ability to comprehend uh, what he intercedes for us for. But we thank you so, so much for that, too. Uh, it makes a huge, huge difference in our life, in our heart. And uh, Lord, thank you that you constantly live to make intercession for us as well. Uh, Thank you for your presence here in this church, in his people. 
And thank you, Father, that this church has stood on the word of God, uh, which is forever. And as we gather today, uh, it's our prayer that we would lift up the Lord Jesus Christ and that we would have the, the, the same uh, similar unity, as, uh, same mind, heart, focus, purpose, as, as we gather here as uh, the saints in this local assembly. Uh, Father, also I pray for other churches in the area that preach the gospel of Christ. Uh, may you anoint the message this morning with those pastors, and may it uh, uh, ignite your people, uh, and that we would burn uh, very, very brightly for you during this uh, Christmas season, and always, uh, and always. Uh, Father, also I lift up uh, Dave. Uh, pray that you would shrink that tumor, uh, and I, uh, we don't care, Lord, how you do it, whether you use medicine or you do it in a miraculous way. And may Edie be able to stand on her feet to be uh, able to begin rehabilitation. And Lord, may Keith be able to get the care uh, that he needs for a doctor to assess his blood condition and uh, why his uh, body is just uh, eating up uh, blood and yet they can't find where it, uh, any place where it leaks. And um, also, Lord, too, um, I pray that you um, would bless Mickey and P Patricia and Fred. Um, and um, just uh, may they sense your goodness and your presence each and every day. Uh, and last but not least, Lord, uh, thank you for the uh, report uh, from Compassion International. We thank you for that work. And thank you for it, uh, how it uh, makes lasting effects in the lives and hearts of those who are supported. And we thank you that we can have a small part uh, in this ministry for the last, oh my goodness, 25 years or so. And um, so uh, we pray that you would bless Miracle and that there would be tremendous miracles that would actually come out of her life and heart uh, to so many, many other people that would eventually come to believe. Uh, so thank you for blessing that work as well. And we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, uh, so do we have Jane here this morning? Where are you, Jane? Oh, you're back there? Okay. Okay. <laughs> I didn't see Jane. I thought she was hiding. <laughs> Um, had started to just kind of like attach some song, uh, some stories to the songs that I've been singing lately. So I did look up this particular one. And um, nothing too much outstanding except for the fact that uh, on 284, if you want to look in your um, hymnal, it is written by uh, William Nedlinger. And he actually was born in 1863, and then he became an accomplished organist and played at the St. Michael's Church in 1896, and then he went to Paris to work as a singing teacher in 1901. He returned to America and settled in Chicago, where he was an esteemed music teacher. So I continued to read, and as a composer, he wrote a broad range of works. But what was very interesting was he wrote a book called um, Small Songs for Small Singers in 1896. And that turned his attention to teaching children, which is kind of near to my heart. And I said, oh, this is getting interesting. <laughs> he took a particular interest in helping children with speech and vocal disabilities, which I thought was really nice, and devoted much of his time his later life to the cause. He did, um, he did create a school in New Jersey for handicapped children. So I thought that was a really nice piece of story to the um, author of this. My voice is a little hoarse, so if you feel free to join me. 
Thank you, Jane. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 12, and that's found on page 866 of the Church Bible. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks, Bill.
Our second scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, the second chapter, verses 1 through 7. And that's found on page 919 of the Church Bible. Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register with, along with Mary, who was engaged to him, and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. This too is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks, Bill. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Lord, may your uh, Holy Spirit uh, have this time in our hearts, and may it be a blessing to our hearts, and may the Lord Jesus Christ be lifted up in this place, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. So, um, last week, when the music was working for the contemporary songs, um, we did a song by Casting Crowns, and uh, it was um, Make Room in Your Heart. And I love the song and the lyrics, uh, and, in, in, and if you were here, the, the song asks a very, very important question. Is there room in your heart to write his story? That's a great, great question. Because if you take a look at the text in chapter 2, verse 7, and it's very, very sad to read this, there was no room for them in the end. Joseph, Mary, and baby Jesus, uh, soon to be born. Uh, John tells us in his gospel, he was in the world and the world was made through him and yet the world did not know him. That's an amazing thing. Uh, if... If he were a worldly king, they would have made room, right? Uh, D.L. Moody, a great 18th century evangelist, made this observation, quote, When the Prince of Wales came to this country, what a welcome he received. When the Prince of Russia came to this country, this is before they were, you know, totalitarian, he said, I saw that him escorted up Broadway, cheer upon cheer went up all the way. New York felt honored that they had such a great guest. The Prince of Wales, during the past few months, has been in India, and what a reception he received there. Even those heathen are glad to do him honor. And when the Prince of Heaven came down, what kind of reception did he meet with? There were no hallelujahs from the people. There, were, there was no room in Bethlehem. What a contrast. No room in the inn, mind you, this is after a very, very long and grueling trip by Mary, and Joseph's probably, she was on a donkey, and he was on foot. Very, very grueling journey. She's very, very pregnant at the time, and probably, ladies, who you've, have you brought children in this world? You know uh, that's very uncomfortable at that stage uh, of the pregnancy. And only to hear, uh, sorry, <laughs> we don't have any room. You know, when I was a kid growing up, my mom and dad taught me that if you're on the bus or the subway, you get up and you offer your seat to a woman. You get up and you offer your seat to a pregnant lady or to an elderly person who can barely stand or, uh, you know, and, and, and make it through. Uh, apparently, there's no social etiquette today. You will rarely see that. And apparently, that was the case back then. They could not find a way. You know, I, I wonder if a dignitary's wife, and in any country in the world, if she went there pregnant and she went into labor, labor, 
What would they do for her? <laughs> oh my goodness, they would make all the room, she'd have all the amenities, right? The very, very best available. They might even empty out, you know, a wing of a hospital or maybe even an entire hotel just for security reasons. And yet there was no room for the Holy Family that night. Uh, no great reception like heads of state would receive. No great fanfare through the streets, no long processions uh, or cheers. Just the angels and the lowly shepherds, the smelly lowly shepherds. And I'm, I'm sure that that was just a wonderful heavenly scene. But you would think that you would have more praise and more hallelujahs, right? Matthew tells us in his gospel, essentially in a roundabout way, yeah, the hallelujahs weren't happening. All of Jerusalem was troubled, right? Herod was troubled. His court was troubled. The high priestly class was troubled. The people were troubled. And that's why it's a very, very great question. Are you troubled? That's why it's a great, great question to ask today. Is there, is there any room in your heart to write his story? Uh, because not much has changed in the last 2,000 years. There's no room for Jesus. Does the world make room for Jesus? What nation wants him? Does America have room today? I take a look at our public policy. He's not wanted in our schools, our town meetings, our halls of government, our public square. Would this White House receive the Christ of Christmas? Highly doubt it. I think they'd receive a bunch of transgender people who take off their shirts on the White House balcony before they'd receive the Lord Jesus Christ. What about other nations in Western culture? England and Canada, they've thrown them out a long time ago. They're socialistic. France wouldn't make room because they're atheistic. I highly doubt Germany wants them either. Uh, go to Germany, they drink an awful lot of alcohol. They're in a, on another planet. Uh, we know, right Bob? <laughs> we know that the Muslim countries don't want them. My brother was in Bahrain years ago on business and he was playing in a pool, he was in a, in a bar in a pool room area and he had this guy come up and he said to him, do you believe that Jesus is the, you, you, oh he said, you think Jesus is the son of God? He says, I don't think I know. Do you know that they tried to kill him before I got out of there? I mean, my brother started to count pool balls on the table to figure out how he might get out of there. And it was only because of a government official who said, you touch him, you're dead men. But you go to a Muslim country, they'll kill you if you mention the name Jesus in connection with being the son of God. What nation wants him? What nation has room for the Lord Jesus Christ? Does China? China's a communist regime. They crack down on Christians and celebrations of Christmas. It, communist regimes don't have room for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and yet, ironically, five years ago, came across an article that said four-fifths of all the, the Christmas stuff made in this country, made by China, right? They want the material blessings, but they don't want the savior that brings that stuff, right? 2,000 years ago, even the nation Israel didn't want him. Uh, John tells us in John chapter 1 of his gospel, verse 11, he came to his own and they didn't even want him. And I sense sadly that if he went to Israel today, they probably wouldn't recognize him either, let alone want him. I think there's going to be uh, some more heartache and more heartbreak before they want him. Uh, clearly, Joseph and Mary's family had nothing to do with them back then, right? Remember, Joseph was of the line of David. He had family in the area. Why is it that family didn't open up the room? Because they saw, probably saw Joseph and Mary as immoral. They have a child out of wedlock. I mean, before the, the time of, of celebration where um, they would consummate the marriage. So they did everything backward from their perspective. I was thinking hypothetically, if Jesus and Mary, not that they would have because scripture has them going to Bethlehem, but if they went five miles more to Jerusalem, 
This is what, I, hypothetically, if they made it there, there would have been no room for them in the palaces, the local government buildings, the halls of the Sanhedrin, no available space for the great thinkers of the day. And you say, well, Pastor, how do you know that? I know that because you fast forward 33 years later, all of these places found little room for the Lord Jesus Christ. Nazareth, the place he grew up, right, threw him out. They tried to throw him over a cliff. There was no room for him among his siblings. Uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 21, it says his brothers and sisters thought he was mad, right? No room in Bethlehem, Jerusalem, and Capernaum. Even though Jesus lodged in Capernaum, they wouldn't even respond to all the miracles he did in Capernaum. They had no room in their heart, they, even though he lodged there. The palace halls, no room for him there. The, the religious and scholastic halls of the day wouldn't even entertain him. You fast forward to our culture today, you tell me. Uh, how many churches would receive the Lord Jesus Christ today? How many would recognize him? Many have thrown out the word of God. They've thrown out sound doctrine. They've gone woke and dark because they don't want the Christ of Christmas. How many of our seminaries would welcome him or recognize him today? I know Andover Newton one is one of the liberal, most liberal con uh, seminaries um, north of Boston in the country. Uh, and it used to be of sound doctrine. I mean, they turn out heretics today, right? How many of our seminaries would, would I mean, uh, look, look at the Sanhedrin. You go back to, the, they were plotting to kill him early on in his ministry. I, I, I fear that it would be the same, same way if Jesus walked uh, to some of our seminaries today. How many professors and religious teachers would welcome him how many, would, how many would give him the pulpit in their, in their everyday morning chapels? How, would they, how many would uh, allow him to teach in their classrooms? I'm certain they would not. How many cities would welcome him or make room for him? Do uh, you think New York City, Mayor Adams, would open up the, the door for the Lord Jesus? I don't think so. How about Chicago? That, that place is crazy. L.A.? Boston, Washington. For those of you who follow the news, you know that they would give it to the illegal immigrant, right? They totally make a room. Free stuff. Go over to the Holiday Inn in Taunton. They're all walking around. Go down to the Marriott right down the street here. All walking all over the place. Free room and board at your expense. Thank you very much, Mr. Biden. They'd give it to the drunkard, drug addict, rapist, murderer, homosexual, transvestite before they give it to the Lord Jesus. It's true. Based on the anti-Semitism climate today, they would make room for Hamas before they'd make room for Jesus. Uh, speaking of Washington, D.C., uh, tell me that Congress would find room in their hearts for Jesus. Anybody. Tell me, do you believe that? Anybody? Uh, talk about a den of thieves and vipers, right? Tell me that they would let him pray before their sessions. If they did, you'd have a big uproar, and they would immediately want to censor him after the fact. That's what they would do. Would they let him have any say on public policy about your hard-earned tax dollars and how it's spent? No, I think not. Uh, do we welcome him in our business and finance communities? How would Jesus fare in corporate America, in a boardroom meeting, when they're all going woke and pushing, you know, ESG? I don't think so. He wouldn't fare. They'd ask him to step down. Would he be welcomed on Wall Street, New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ? No, I don't think so. He would not find room in their ends. Uh, I think Jesus would have a lot to say on how the riches have corrupted their morals and rotted their soul. They throw them out. Would the Lord Jesus Christ be welcomed in our universities? Hardly. Just the other day, maybe you saw it, the presidents of Harvard University and the University of Penn 
went before Congress and they couldn't bring themselves to say that the call for the genocide of the Jews on their campuses was harassment and wrong. Couldn't even bring themselves to do it. Uh, they played the word salad game, right? Intelligent, very, very intelligent people, way more intelligent academically than, uh, than I could ever begin to imagine or dream of. Uh, it's just common sense, right, folks? But these, these people have no common sense. Can you imagine them, the college campuses, letting Jesus on campus to share his message? Oh, man, I would pay for that. I would pay for that. Can you imagine letting him speak his mind about the call for the genocide of the Jewish people? That would be a sermon. Uh, Christ does not give an equal time or room with any ancient philosophers or any contemporary philosophers. What they do is they put them on the library shelf. That's the room that they give. I just saw the other day uh, there was uh, an atheist uh, that uh, was trying to get the Bible banned from one of the local libraries, and he failed, thank God. At least the Bible's still on the shelf, right? And so the reality is, is we, we love the form of Christmas, right? Our institutions and our people are satisfied with the form. We love the music, the glitter, the holiday gatherings. We love the trees and the lights and the gifts. Even if you're, tell me, even if you're an adult, isn't it so cool to drive down and around at night and to see the way places are decorated? It's pretty cool, right? I mean, it still has its charm and its magic. And then, and, and tell me, because I know there's a little kid in each side of us, don't you love to get a gift? Everybody loves to get a gift, right? Right, you just love gifts. There's, that's pretty cool. But, the worship of Christ is largely out the window. Sadly, it's been forgotten. So in many places, there's no room for God, right? And as bleak and as pessimistic and as sad as that may sound, there is always a place for God. Uh, you take a look at the scriptures, Jesus often frequented the home of Martha, in Bethany, that home was wide open to the Lord Jesus Christ. You have all the Marthas and all the Marys and all the Lazarus in Scripture. And if there were Joes and Johns back then, I know there were Johns and there were Joes. If they opened their heart, the Lord Jesus Christ would enter that heart. He's always had a place in the lives of those people called the saints. And that's the, that's the blessed Blessed thought here that comes out of this today. Christ will gladly come to the heart that makes room for him. I came across a devotional thought the other day. Uh, it, it referenced uh, my heart, Christ's home. It's a little pamphlet, by the way. Uh, oh my goodness, it's like no, no more, no, no bigger, uh, maybe twice the size of a credit card, about 32 pages. I mean, you can read it and Five minutes. It takes me about seven because I'm a slow reader, okay? But uh, it's um, My Heart, Christ's Home. And this is what the author said, quote, Without question, one of the most remarkable Christian doctrines is that Jesus Christ himself, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, will actually enter a heart, settle down, and be at home there. Christ will make the human heart his abode. That's a precious, precious thought. You know, we have this expression today, home is where the heart is, right? The heart is his home today when we open it up and we make room for him. It's not tabernacles made by hands anymore. He inhabits hearts. My heart, your heart, many, many others' hearts for people who make room for him. And if our hearts are home to him, then, uh, and this is what the little pamphlet says, it's important that his stay be comfortable, pleasant, peaceful. It's important that we make him feel at home, right? And so I would encourage you to read that little book, a pamphlet. You can actually get it online for free. Uh, and kind of post it as a PDF file. Uh, My Heart, Christ's Home by Robert Boyd Munger, right? 
So, as believers, we've made room in our hearts. And what we want to see here is that there's always opportunity to make more room. Uh, maybe it's a little room for some. Maybe it's much room for some. Uh, you know where you're at. God knows where you're at, right? But, but here's, the, here's the precious nugget of truth. Whatever you give him, he's going to take. If you give him just a little bit, he'll take it. And if you give him a lot, he'll take it. God will always take whatever we give him. Uh, D.L. Moody rightly observed that the only room, get this, the only room that the world ever had for Jesus was room on a cross. He willingly took that too. He took what the world even gave him. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. You know, um, from week to week, I get up here and I have to, I pray, I say I have to, I pray that God always gives me something. And I'm telling you, there are some weeks where I'm dry, folks, maybe like yourself. But, you know, there's always this challenge and this struggle to enthrone Christ daily on the heart. Now, you know, we're so sinful, we all have that struggle, right? But the challenge is to give him more room, always more room. Uh, somebody said to me this past week, there's always more we can give him. Amen? That's true. You know, I'll tell you, I, I told this story before, I walked the aisle at the end of a church service many, many years ago to answer the call to the gospel ministry. And, you know, I thought, oh my goodness, it's finally done. And then I realized that God wanted more and more and more. And it still happens to this day. He wants more and more and more. It's the way it is. But that's a good thing, right? When God gets more of my heart, that's a good thing. When God gets more of your heart, that's, that's a good thing. So, um, in closing, for believers, it's, it's not, uh, have we any room for Jesus? Of course we have room. That's why we're here this morning. Uh, but the question is, how much room do we have? How much are we willing to give him? Those are the questions. And so the challenge is always uh, make room, make a little more room, make more room, and give him much room. That's always the challenge each and every day. Because after all, I, and, I, and I think you're like me in this regard, after all, you do want him to write his story upon your heart, amen? That's what we want. And that's a glorious, glorious story and a beautiful, beautiful thing. And uh, anyway, that's what God has laid upon my heart today. And um, uh, Lord bless you for being here. Let's, let's pray. Um, gracious Heavenly Father, um, we thank you for the Word of God, and we, uh, our hearts uh, break uh, when we read that there was no room for them in the inn uh, many, many years ago, and yet nothing's really changed. We um, see that um, in many, many uh, respects today, uh, but but we thank you that you've made room in our hearts by opening uh, our hearts to the knowledge of the truth. And Lord, it's our desire that we would give you more of our hearts, um, uh, more room, um, much room. Uh, that's our prayer. Uh, each and every day, as we struggle to enthrone you upon uh, our hearts, uh, we, we pray that we would give you um, uh, more room and much room. Uh, we want uh, your story um, to be indelibly uh, written upon our hearts, and we bless you for what you've done so far in our lives. Uh, we want to give you all the glory and the honor and the praise, and thank you for each heart that is here this day, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 250, O Little Town of Bethlehem, 250.
Yes. Oh, we're going to change the hymn to 478? Okay. She's in control. 478. <laughs> 